Without acting, we could have no theater. If, by definition, the main art object of theater is dramatic action, or as Aristotle termed it, mimesis, then the work of the actor is at the core of the art of theater. In the last episode, we spoke of the myth of Thespius, which suggested that theater began in ancient Greece when Thespius, a member of a dithyrambic chorus engaging in a worship ceremony, jumped on to the sacrificial altar and began a dialogue with members of the chorus. While it is more than unlikely that theater actually began from this scenario, this myth contains a framework for a valuable exploration into the art of acting and its place in the creation of this artful form of storytelling. That will be the focus of this episode. When I teach acting, I begin by asking the students to describe what qualities are evident in the best that acting has to offer. Among the responses, I'm often assured that good acting is believable or realistic. It's true that these are worthy goals, but the notion of realism as a goal for acting is something that was not actively pursued until the 20th century. Since the art of theater has been around since at least the 6th century BC, it's worth looking into those qualities into which our realistic form of theater evolved. As we have said, theater is a form of storytelling. The best stories are lively enough to keep us interested and entertained, but we also expect a payoff that made the time we spent with the story worth our while. It's for this reason that stories are often instructional in nature. But we also require an emotional payoff from a story as well. This emotional expectation is to what the philosopher Aristotle was referring when he spoke of catharsis. Early theater evolved from sacred rituals and, as a result, were designed to inspire awe as well as provide instruction. For this reason, Realism would have fallen short in serving the early sacred and monumental purposes of theater. The first plays that we have were written by the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus. His plays differed from those we present today in that they were structured to present their action with a single actor playing all of the roles. Naturally, this structure limited the opportunity for action and creates a condition where storytelling can become static by contemporary standards. One of the early theatrical devices that was used to address this limiting condition was the dramatic mask. The ancient Greek tragedies were presented in a series of scenes that alternated with choral passages. Each scene would take place between the actor and the chorus. The chorus would remain in the orchestra, and the actor would take their place on a raised area located to one end of the orchestra, known as the proscanian. Today, we refer to this area as the stage. Behind the actor was the skena, or scene house. When the scene ended, the actor would exit the proscanian into the skena. Upon the actor's exit, the chorus would engage in a choral passage. In this passage, the members of the chorus would dance and chant on themes or conditions of the play. During the choral passage, the actor would change his mask and costume so that upon their entrance, they could play a different character for the next scene. The actor's mask served the practical purpose of allowing the actor to play different characters during the course of a single tragedy, but there is also something powerfully psychological that occurs with the donning of the mask in performance. This is the phenomenon of acting as persona. In the last episode, we spoke of Aristotle's term, mimesis, which defines theater as an imitation of an action. But the ancient philosophers also understood that there was something almost unexplainable about the process of wearing a mask and taking on the persona 
of another human being. Plato referred to this process as a divine madness, how the act of putting on a mask to represent a human other than ourselves causes us to assume the personality or persona of that individual during the time that we wear the mask. This element of assuming a persona was described by both Aristotle and Plato as man's attempt to achieve perfection. This is one of the reasons that theater is an essential element of education. Science and math do much to unlock the mysteries of human existence, but only in the art of acting, the process of assuming someone else's life or persona, do we engage in a learning process that pulses through our veins and teaches us what it means to be a human being. So this act of donning a mask is the process of assuming a persona. Engaging in the action of the character is the process of mimesis. Blending these results is the art of acting in its most primitive terms. The dramatic mask serves a pivotal role in the evolution of theater. The plays of the ancient Greek playwright Sophocles included two actors for each scene so that those performers on the Proscanian could engage in a dialogue as the chorus looked on, representing society. Later, the playwright Euripides added even more actors to the presentation of theater and diminished the importance of the chorus, elevating the powerful dynamics of persona and mimesis. And masks have been a part of the theater from this early period through the Italian Renaissance with the Commedia dell'arte. And it continued in some form through the time of William Shakespeare and Moliere. Today, the process of putting on stage makeup to assume the persona of another individual is the culmination of the history of the dramatic mask. This evolution is not only evident in acting, but also in the stagecraft and production values of early theater. That will be the focus of the next episode of Theater, Storytelling in Action. We'll catch you on the other side.